nestled between the expansive plains of what is now Pakistan and northwest India, the Indus Valley civilization holds a special place in the annals of ancient history. Flourishing around 2500 BCE, it was a society marked by its unique culture, sophisticated urban planning and technological prowess. This wasn't just a collection of settlements, but an entire civilization that mirrored the contemporary societies of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. One of the most notable aspects of the Indus Valley society was its urbanization. Cities like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa weren't mere villages, but bustling urban centers. Their city designs were startlingly advanced for their time. Streets were laid out in a grid pattern and houses were made of uniform baked bricks, an indication of a centralized authority and planning. The drainage systems in these cities were so efficient that they can give our modern sewer systems a run for their money. These weren't primitive people, but a society that valued hygiene, organization, and forward thinking. Yet, what stands out even more than their advancements is the script they left behind. This script, undeciphered to this day, offers a tantalizing puzzle for historians and linguists. Thousands of seals have been discovered adorned with this unique script. It is a testament to a rich language, a window into their thoughts, beliefs, and values. But until we can crack the code, much of their daily life and philosophies remain an enigma. Despite their sophistication, the Indus Valley civilization began to decline around 1900 BCE. This wasn't a slow descent, but a rather rapid dwindling leading historians and archaeologists on a quest to find out why. Some theories suggest a massive tectonic event altered the course of their life-giving rivers. The once fertile plains may have become arid, making agriculture, which was the backbone of their society, increasingly difficult. This environmental challenge could have spurred mass migrations to more fertile areas, leading to a rapid depopulation of the urban centers, yet nature might not be the sole culprit. Another theory is that of external invasions. Some historians suggest that a new wave of immigrants, possibly the Aryans, came into the region, leading to cultural and societal shifts. While there isn't conclusive evidence to fully back this theory, it remains a possibility. In the end, the downfall of the Indus Valley civilization is a mosaic of factors, a confluence of environmental challenges, potential external threats, and perhaps even internal strife. Their decline serves as a haunting reminder that even the most advanced and sophisticated societies can be vulnerable to a combination of challenges. The remnants of their cities, artifacts, and the undeciphered script they left behind are silent witnesses to a past that was both glorious and, ultimately, ephemeral. The Mediterranean Sea, with its azure waters and sun-kissed shores, has been a cradle for many ancient civilizations, but few are as enigmatic and captivating as the Minoans of Crete. Dating back to roughly 3000 BCE, the Minoans are often considered Europe's first advanced civilization, and their influence is visible in various facets of history. Crete, a rugged island south of Greece, became the epicenter of Minoan culture. The civilization is named after the legendary King Minos, a figure intricately connected with the myth of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. It's a tale of intrigue where a fearsome beast roamed within an intricate maze, demanding annual sacrifices until the hero, Theseus, with the help of Minos' daughter Ariadne, ventured in to end its reign of terror. While this is steeped in mythology, it speaks to the rich tapestry of stories and beliefs that emanated from this ancient society. Architecturally, the Minoans were masters. The palace complexes, most notably the one at Knossos, were sprawling and labyrinthine, perhaps inspiring the myths themselves. These weren't just royal residences, but centers of administrative, religious, and economic activity. Their vibrant frescoes found within these palaces provide a colorful insight into Minoan life. Scenes of ritualistic ceremonies, marine life, and even sports like bull leaping bring the Minoans' world to life, showcasing a society deeply connected to both the sea and their spiritual beliefs. Trade was the lifeblood of the Minoan civilization, their strategic location in the Mediterranean made them a pivotal maritime power. Artifacts from Egypt, the Levant, and even Mesopotamia have been unearthed in Crete, while Minoan pottery has been discovered as far afield as Turkey, Israel, and even Egypt. This extensive network not only brought in goods, but also facilitated a cultural exchange that enriched the Minoan way of life. 
But as with many ancient societies, the Minoans faced their twilight. Around 1450 BCE, their dominance began to wane. But what led to their decline? Natural disasters play a lead role in theories about their downfall. The eruption of the Thera volcano, one of the most powerful in human history, is believed to have had catastrophic effects on Crete. The ensuing tsunami and ash fallout would have decimated crops, disrupted trade, and caused widespread chaos. Yet, Mother Nature might not be the sole reason. The emergence of the Mycenaeans from mainland Greece posed a significant challenge. As they expanded their influence, the balance of power shifted. There's evidence to suggest the Mycenaeans took over many Minoan centers, either through conquest or assimilation. Despite their decline, the Minoans left an indelible mark on history. Their art, architecture, and myths have been sources of fascination and inspiration for millennia. As we wander through the remnants of their palaces or lose ourselves in their tales, we're reminded of the transient nature of civilizations and the lasting legacies they can leave behind. In the high deserts of the American Southwest, amidst the rugged terrains of modern-day Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, echoes of an ancient culture linger. Here, tucked into the mesas, cliffs, and canyons, we find remnants of a civilization that once thrived but then mysteriously receded, the ancestral Puebloans. Often recognized by their earlier designation, the Anasazi, the ancestral Puebloans were a complex society that flourished from roughly AD 100 to 1600. This time frame, while broad, encompasses a rich tapestry of development, innovation and adaptation to the challenging desert environment. One of the most distinctive architectural achievements of the ancestral Puebloans was their cliff dwellings. These structures, like those found in Mesa Verde National Park, are intricate communities carved into the alcoves of towering sandstone cliffs. Crafted with precision, these dwellings provided protection from the elements and potential adversaries. Complementing these cliff homes were ceremonial chambers known as kivas, subterranean spaces where religious rites and social gatherings took place, emphasizing the spiritual dimension of their lives. Beyond their iconic cliff homes, the ancestral Puebloans demonstrated a sophisticated understanding of agriculture. Despite the arid climate, they developed farming techniques that harnessed every drop of precious water. Terraced gardens, check dams, and irrigation systems allowed them to cultivate maize, beans, and squash, a trio often referred to as the Three Sisters, which became the staple of their diet. Artistically, they were no less accomplished. Their pottery, characterized by intricate black and white designs, wasn't just functional but symbolically significant, often carrying motifs related to their myths and cosmology. Petroglyphs and pictographs, images carved or painted onto stone surfaces, also bear testament to their rich cultural narrative, weaving stories of their beliefs, daily life, and the world around them. However, around the end of the 13th century, something shifted. The once bustling cliff dwellings and mesa top villages began to show signs of rapid abandonment. Scholars and archaeologists have long pondered this exodus. While no single reason can be pinpointed, a combination of prolonged drought, resource depletion, social upheaval, and possible external threats might have compelled them to seek greener pastures. As they migrated, they didn't vanish into the annals of history but rather evolved, giving rise to the modern Pueblo cultures we recognize today. Their descendants, the Hopi, Zuni, and Rio Grande Pueblo people, continue to honor the legacy of the ancestral Puebloans, maintaining many of their traditions, rituals, and the spirit of resilience that once echoed through the mesas and canyons of the Southwest. Nestled in the heart of Southeast Asia, spanning across modern-day Cambodia and parts of Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand, lies the footprint of one of history's most remarkable empires, the Khmer Empire. This civilization, flourishing between the 9th and 15th centuries, is often overshadowed by its contemporaries, yet its contributions to art, architecture, and culture resonate powerfully even today. The dawn of the Khmer Empire can be traced back to the reign of Jayavarman II in the late 9th century. Establishing his capital at Hariharalaya, near the modern town of Roluos, Jayavarman II delayed the foundation for an empire that would dominate the region for over 600 years. Under his leadership and the monarchs that followed, the Khmer Empire experienced an era of unprecedented growth and prosperity. Central to the legacy of the Khmer Empire are its architectural marvels. 
The most iconic among them is the temple complex of Angkor Wat. This vast structure, originally dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, exemplifies the Khmer architectural style with its intricate base reliefs, towering spires and expansive courtyards. But Angkor Wat is just the crown jewel in the larger city of Angkor, which was once the world's largest urban center. The city's ruins, scattered across the Cambodian landscape, are a testament to its past grandeur with temples like Ban, known for its serene stone faces, and Ta Prom, a fusion of nature and architecture as trees intertwine with ancient stones. Yet the Khmer Empire wasn't solely about magnificent structures. The empire's intricate water management system, consisting of canals, moats, and vast reservoirs called barays, showcased their understanding of hydrology. This advanced system not only provided water for daily use and irrigation, ensuring multiple rice harvests annually, but also symbolized the cosmic sea, reflecting their spiritual beliefs. The Khmer Empire's cultural and spiritual fabric was a blend of indigenous beliefs and outside influences. Initially rooted in Hinduism with deities like Vishnu and Shiva revered, the empire gradually embraced Mahayana and later Theravada Buddhism. This transition is visible in the art and inscriptions from the period, depicting a synthesis of religious motifs. However, as with all great empires, the sunset on the Khmer era eventually came. By the end of the 15th century, the empire began to fragment. External pressures, notably from the Thai kingdoms to the west, played a role in its decline. Additionally, environmental factors like changing waterways and possibly over-exploitation of the land may have contributed to the empire's gradual fall. The Khmer Empire's decline wasn't an abrupt end, but a gradual transition. While the capital and political power shifted, the cultural and spiritual legacies persisted. Modern-day Cambodia is deeply rooted in this rich heritage. Every sunrise over Angkor Wat, every dance move in the traditional Apsara performance, and every thread in the fabric of Cambodian life carries whispers of the grandeur and mysteries of the Khmer era. An era where the blend of art, spirituality and innovation painted a vivid picture of human potential. What if I told you that beneath the shimmering waves of the Indian Ocean, there lies a submerged city that just might be a legendary kingdom mentioned in an ancient epic? Yes, we're going on a deep dive into the story of Dwarka, a city described in the Mahabharata, one of the major Sanskrit epics of ancient India. This isn't just an exploration of myth and legend, but also a journey through the fascinating realms of underwater archaeology and radiocarbon dating. So let's plunge into the depths and discover the captivating saga of Dwarka. Dwarka is more than just a name. It's a word that translates to the gateway to heaven. According to Hindu mythology, this majestic city was established by none other than Lord Krishna, a deity worshipped as the eighth avatar of Lord Vishnu. Now, who is Krishna, you might ask? Krishna, a central figure in Hinduism, is widely revered for his wisdom, his strategic prowess, his supernatural feats, and his role as a charioteer, advisor, and friend to Prince Arjuna in the epic Mahabharata. In this ancient text, Krishna flees to the western coast of India after a catastrophic war. Here he establishes the city of Dwarka, a city so opulent and grand that it's often described as a city made of gold. But as stories go, this magnificent city meets a tragic end. After Krishna's death, a series of calamities strike. Submerged by the sea in a matter of days, the city disappears, taking all its architectural grandeur and wealth along with it. The tale of Dwarka is fascinating in its own right, but here's where it gets even more interesting. This myth aligns with a geological phenomenon known as sea level rise, which could result in the submergence of coastal settlements. So this begs the question, is Dwarka just a symbolic tale or could it be an actual historical event dressed in myth and legend? The archaeology unit of the National Institute of Oceanography is making headlines. The team is embarking on an underwater archaeological expedition to see what lies beneath the sea at Dwarka, on the western coast of India. Led by archaeologists S.R. Rao and As Gaur, the team discovers something that shakes up the world of archaeology. Structural remains and artifacts suggesting the existence of an ancient city. The expedition reveals well-planned stone structures, pottery shards, semi-precious stones and inscriptions, some of which date back to the Harappan civilization around 2000 BCE. 
The discoveries don't stop there. Subsequent underwater explorations reveal an extensive network of stone structures, extending over half a mile, which appears to have been built on the bank of an ancient river, the Gomati. The stone structures, ceramics and inscriptions lend credibility to the existence of a bustling urban center in antiquity. It's an intriguing find, right? But there's a twist. The artifacts and structures found underwater not only suggest the existence of an ancient city, but also hint at a city that may have been submerged by rising sea levels, aligning strikingly with the legend of Dwarka. Could it be that the legend of Dwarka was not merely a legend, but a page out of our own historical past preserved in mythology? So we have established that there's something under the sea at Dwarka, but what exactly did the explorers find? Well, the discoveries at Dwarka were nothing short of astonishing. Firstly, pottery shards were found in abundance. These pieces of ancient ceramics were from a variety of different eras, some of them dating back to the late Harappan period. The variety in pottery styles suggests that Dwarka was inhabited over an extensive period of time, housing several generations of people. Then there were the semi-precious stones. These materials, often used for making jewelry, speak volumes about the economic prosperity of the city. The presence of such materials suggests that Dwarka was a trade center, exchanging goods with different parts of the ancient world. Next, there were the inscriptions. The most important of these was a seal that bore the image of a three-headed animal. The symbolism behind this creature remains a mystery, but the very fact that the inhabitants of Dwarka had a complex system of symbols suggests a sophisticated society and then, of course, there were the architectural remains. Stone structures of various shapes and sizes were found, giving archaeologists a glimpse into the layout of the city. Among these structures, a series of circular fort-like constructions, believed to be part of the city's defense system, were particularly remarkable. Taken together, these discoveries form a remarkable narrative of an ancient city that was, in its time, a hub of civilization and commerce. And this narrative, much to our astonishment, aligns remarkably well with the mythical city of Dwarka described in the Mahabharata. In a world where we want hard facts, the science of radiocarbon dating can act as our time machine, providing an objective lens through which to view the past. And it was this scientific tool that was used to try and pinpoint the age of the submerged city of Dwarka. Radiocarbon dating works by estimating the age of organic materials, which include ancient artifacts and biological specimens. It's based on the principle that all living things contain carbon, some of which is radioactive C14. When a creature or plant dies, it stops absorbing this radioactive carbon, but the C14 it already contains continues to decay. By measuring the remaining quantity of C14, scientists can estimate how long ago the organism died, or in our case, when the artifacts were last used or made. Applying this technique, pieces of wood from Dwarka were sent to laboratories where they were analyzed for radiocarbon content. The results? The wood samples were found to date back to around 7,500 years ago, vastly predating the expected timeline of Mahabharata, according to most historians. This significant revelation opened up a Pandora's box of questions. Could the submerged city really be the mythical Dwarka? If so, does it mean that our timeline of the Mahabharata is off? Or does it suggest that the city was inhabited long before Krishna supposedly ruled there and the epic merely borrowed the location's rich history? The radiocarbon dating results were a fascinating discovery, adding a new layer of complexity to the mystery of Dwarka. It reminds us that the lines between history, archaeology and mythology can blur, leaving us to ponder on the intersection of fact and fiction. How does radiocarbon dating work? Let's step back from the Dwarka and elaborate a little more on this interesting way to measure age. Alright, so imagine you're watching a video on YouTube. When the video starts, it's fully loaded, right? Now let's say you pause the video and go grab a snack. When you come back, you notice that the video has unloaded a bit. It's been buffering and you can't play it right away. That's a bit like how radiocarbon dating works. But instead of a video, we're talking about a kind of stuff called carbon-14. You see, everything that was once alive, like a tree, a dinosaur, or a woolly mammoth, absorbed a type of carbon called carbon-14 when they were living. Once they die, they stop taking in new carbon-14. But here's the cool part. 
Carbon-14 is a little bit like a slowly buffering YouTube video. Over time, it changes or decays into another kind of stuff called nitrogen-14. Scientists call the time it takes for half of the carbon-14 to change into nitrogen-14 its half-life. Kind of like if half your video had to buffer before you could watch it. For carbon-14, this half-life is about 5,730 years. Now let's say we find a really old piece of wood and we want to know when the tree it came from stopped living. We can't ask the tree, obviously, but we can use a special tool to measure how much carbon-14 is still in the wood compared to how much carbon-12, a type of carbon that doesn't change over time, is in it. If there's a lot of carbon-14 left, the tree probably hasn't been dead very long, but if there's only a little carbon-14 left, that means the tree has been dead for a very long time, and that's pretty much how radiocarbon dating works. Scientists use this method to tell how old things are that used to be alive from ancient wooden tools to prehistoric animal bones. It's like a time machine that helps us uncover the secrets of the past. The discussion surrounding the ancient city of Dwaka isn't without its skeptics. These are the people who question the conclusions that have been drawn from the archaeological evidence, and their doubts are an important part of the scientific process. One of the main areas of skepticism revolves around the age of the underwater city. Critics point out that while certain samples tested using radiocarbon dating suggest an older date, this doesn't necessarily confirm that the city itself is of the same age. In other words, older organic material could have been incorporated into a younger settlement. Skeptics also point to the complexity and size of the structures that have been found underwater. They argue that these structures are far more sophisticated than what is typically associated with other sites from the same period. Some even suggest that the underwater ruins could be the remnants of a much more recent settlement, potentially even dating to medieval times. Then there's the question of the city's connection to the ancient epic, the Mahabharata. Skeptics argue that just because a city is found where the mythical Dwarka is said to have been, doesn't mean it's the same city. After all, there could have been multiple settlements in the area over the thousands of years of human history. Finally, skeptics argue that more research needs to be done. The underwater site is extensive, and only a small portion has been thoroughly investigated. Until more of the city is explored and more artifacts are found and tested, skeptics caution against drawing firm conclusions about the site's age and cultural significance. But where does that leave us? A submerged city, radiocarbon dates that point to immense antiquity, and a saga that may or may not be the echoes of a distant past. The quest for understanding Dwarka is a testament to the human spirit's insatiable curiosity, bridging the gap between myth and science. So the next time you gaze at the vast expanse of the ocean, remember that beneath its surface may lie stories waiting to be discovered. But as always, the journey towards knowledge is as fascinating as the destination itself. Ancient Japan, with its rich history and culture, has fascinated us for centuries. Among the most iconic figures from this time are the samurai, an elite warrior class who lived by a strict code of honor and discipline. Today we're going to explore the unique traditions and lifestyle of the samurai, delving into what it meant to be a samurai in ancient Japan. We'll also take a look at the remarkable engineering and architectural innovations of the time, along with other intriguing aspects of ancient Japanese society. So let's step back in time and immerse ourselves in the world of ancient Japan. Welcome to life's biggest questions. Now let's continue to delve deeper into the world of the samurai Let's first take a look at the broader historical context of ancient Japan. The Heian period, 794-1185 CE, marked a significant turning point for Japan, with the establishment of the imperial capital in Kyoto, then called Heian Kyo, and the flourishing of the arts and literature. It was also during this time that the samurai emerged as a distinct warrior class, protecting the interests of their noble patrons and playing a crucial role in the power struggles that shaped Japan's political landscape. As Japan moved into the Kamakura, 1185 to 1333 CE, and Muromachi, 1336 to 1573 CE periods, the role of the samurai continued to evolve. The establishment of the first shogunate or military government in Kamakura marked the beginning of a new era where the samurai class held significant political power. This shift in power dynamics set the stage for the rise of prominent samurai clans, such as the Taira, Minamoto, and later, the Ashikaga. 
the samurai's role in society extended far beyond the battlefield. As members of the ruling class, they were expected to be well-versed in poetry, literature, and the art. The tale of Genji, often regarded as the world's first novel, was written during the Heian period by Lady Murasaki Shikibu and was widely read and appreciated among the samurai class. This emphasis on cultural refinement set the samurai apart from other warrior classes throughout history, illustrating the unique blend of martial prowess and intellectual pursuits that characterized the samurai way of life. In addition to their martial and cultural roles, the samurai also played an essential part in shaping Japan's legal system. The development of the Gosebai Shikimoku, or the Formulary of Adjudications in 1232 during the Kamakura period, was a crucial step in codifying the laws and practices that governed samurai society. This legal code established a set of principles that guided the samurai's conduct both on and off the battlefield, and further reinforced the importance of Bujido in the daily lives of these elite warriors. The world of the samurai was steeped in tradition, with various unique customs and rituals shaping their daily lives. These practices were not only integral to the samurai's personal growth and development, but also served to strengthen the bonds within their communities and reinforce their commitment to the principles of Bushido. One such tradition was the practice of meditation, which allowed samurai to cultivate mental clarity, self-discipline and emotional resilience. By developing their ability to remain focused and present in the face of adversity, samurai warriors were able to maintain a heightened sense of awareness on the battlefield and make strategic decisions under pressure. In addition to meditation, the samurai also engaged in rigorous physical training, known as keiko, which included martial arts disciplines such as kendo, kudo, and jujitsu. These practices not only honed the samurai's physical prowess, but also reinforced the spiritual and mental aspects of their training. The concept of mushin, or no mind, was particularly important in these disciplines, as it encouraged the samurai to act instinctively and without hesitation in the heat of battle. Another fascinating samurai tradition was the practice of ikebana, or Japanese flower arrangement. This art form emphasized the harmonious arrangement of flowers, branches, and other natural elements, fostering a deep appreciation for nature and its inherent beauty. For the samurai, the practice of ikebana was more than just a creative outlet. It was a means of cultivating a sense of balance and tranquility, which was essential to their success as warriors. Samurai also had a unique relationship with poetry, particularly the traditional Japanese form known as tanka. Composed of five lines with a syllable pattern of 57577, tanka poetry was a means for samurai to express their thoughts and emotions in a concise and elegant manner. In many cases, samurai would engage in friendly poetry competitions, known as yuta awais, as a way of honing their literary skills and fostering camaraderie among their peers. The practice of yabusame, or horseback archery, was another unique samurai tradition that required great skill, concentration, and discipline. The samurai would train rigorously to develop the ability to shoot accurately while riding at high speeds, demonstrating their mastery of both horsemanship and archery. Yabusame events were often held as ceremonial demonstrations, with samurai showcasing their prowess in front of their lords and fellow warriors. The samurai were renowned for their mastery of various weapons, each with its unique characteristics and uses on the battlefield. While the katana is perhaps the most iconic of these weapons, samurai were also skilled in the use of a range of other arms, which played an essential role in their martial prowess. One such weapon was the yumi, a traditional Japanese longbow, which was a key component of the samurai's arsenal. The yumi was asymmetric, with a lower grip to accommodate shooting from horseback. Archery was considered a highly honorable skill, and samurai trained rigorously to become expert marksmen, able to hit targets with incredible accuracy even at long distances. Another notable weapon was the naginata, a polearm with a curved blade at the end. The naginata was particularly effective in close combat situations, allowing the wielder to strike with considerable force while maintaining a safe distance from their opponent. This weapon was also popular among samurai women, who were trained in its use for self-defense and to protect their homes in times of conflict. Samurai also employed the use of the Tanto, a short dagger used primarily for close-quarters combat and in ritual suicide or seppuku. 
The Tanto was often carried alongside the katana, providing the samurai with a versatile secondary weapon when needed. The armor worn by samurai was meticulously crafted to provide maximum protection without sacrificing mobility. The design of this armor evolved over time, reflecting changes in warfare and the specific needs of the samurai class. Early samurai armor known as Oo Yoroi was characterized by large boxy cuirasses and helmets adorned with intricate ornamentation. However, as warfare shifted toward more infantry-based combat, the armor design changed to become more flexible and lightweight, resulting in the development of the Domaru and later the Tose Gusoko. Samurai armor was typically made from a combination of materials including iron, leather and silk, which were carefully layered and laced together to create a highly effective, protective garment. The helmet, or kabuto, was a particularly important component of the samurai's armor, often featuring elaborate crests and decorations that signified the wearer's rank and family lineage. One striking aspect of samurai armor was its aesthetic appeal. Each piece of armor was carefully crafted and often adorned with intricate designs, reflecting the wearer's personal taste and status. This attention to detail extended even to the smallest components, such as the fittings on the sword scabbard, which were often made from precious metals and featured intricate carvings and inlays. Ancient Japan was home to a wealth of engineering and architectural innovations, which have left a lasting impact on the nation's landscape and cultural identity. These advances not only demonstrated the ingenuity and resourcefulness of the Japanese people, but also played a crucial role in shaping the nation's political, economic and social development. One of the most iconic architectural achievements of ancient Japan was the construction of castles, which served as the fortified residences of powerful samurai lords. Japanese castle design was heavily influenced by the needs of the samurai class, with a focus on defensive capabilities and adaptability to the nation's varied terrain. Japanese castles were typically built on strategic hilltops, surrounded by a series of concentric walls and moats to provide multiple layers of defense, the central keep, or Tenshu, was the heart of the castle, housing the lord's living quarters and serving as a symbol of his authority. Castles were designed to make use of the natural landscape for defense, incorporating elements such as cliffs, rivers and ravines to create a formidable fortress. One unique feature of Japanese castle design was the use of stone foundations, which supported the wooden structures above. These foundations, known as Ishiotoshi, were carefully constructed using large, irregularly shaped stones, which were expertly fitted together without the use of mortar. This technique allowed the foundations to flex and shift during earthquakes, providing greater stability and resilience to these wooden structures. Ancient Japan was also home to a number of impressive religious structures, such as the Todaiji Temple in Nara. This temple, which houses the world's largest bronze statue of the Buddha, was constructed in the 8th century using a unique method of interlocking wooden beams known as Kanawatsuge. This technique allowed the massive structure to be built without the use of nails, creating a flexible and earthquake-resistant framework that has stood the test of time. Japanese gardens were another area where engineering and architectural ingenuity were on display, these carefully designed spaces were intended to evoke a sense of tranquility and harmony with nature, often incorporating elements such as ponds, bridges and carefully placed rocks to create a balanced and visually appealing landscape. The use of shakki, or borrowed scenery, was a key concept in Japanese garden design as it allowed the garden to incorporate distant natural features, such as mountains or trees, into the overall composition. The ancient Japanese were also skilled in the construction of wooden bridges, which were essential for traversing the nation's many rivers and streams. One notable example is the Kintai Bridge, which was built in the 17th century and features a series of five wooden arches. This unique design allowed the bridge to withstand floods and other natural disasters, while also providing an aesthetically pleasing focal point for the surrounding landscape. One interesting aspect of ancient Japan was the development of its writing system. The Japanese language initially had no written form, but with the introduction of Chinese characters known as kanji in the 4th century, Japan began to develop a unique writing system. Over time, two phonetic scripts, hiragana and katakana, emerged, allowing for greater flexibility and expression in written Japanese. This combination of kanji, hiragana and katakana 
formed the basis of the Japanese writing system, which is still in use today. The Noh theatre is another fascinating aspect of ancient Japanese culture. Noh is a form of classical Japanese drama that combines music, dance and drama in a highly stylized and ritualized manner. Originating in the 14th century, no plays often feature supernatural themes and explore the boundaries between the mortal and spiritual realms. The performances are characterized by their slow, deliberate movements and the use of intricately carved wooden masks, which serve to enhance the actor's expressions and convey deep emotions. In the realm of cuisine, ancient Japan developed a unique culinary tradition that emphasized simplicity, seasonality, and an appreciation for natural flavors. The foundation of Japanese cuisine is based on the principle of Ichiju Sansai, which translates to one soup, three dishes. This concept revolves around the idea of a balanced meal, consisting of a soup, a main dish, usually fish or meat, and two side dishes accompanied by rice and pickles. This principle is still at the heart of Japanese cuisine today, emphasizing harmony and balance in both flavor and presentation. Did you know that despite their rudimentary technology, some ancient civilizations seem to know things about outer space that they technically shouldn't. Now, I'm not talking about aliens or anything supernatural. I'm talking about good old-fashioned observations and maybe a dash of intuition. But how much did they really know? Let's find out. The Mayans and Venus. Now, the Mayans were not just your average stargazers. These were people who took their celestial observations to a whole new level. Imagine you have no telescope, no calculus, and no modern physics, but you're tasked with understanding the mysteries of the cosmos. What do you do? Well, you do what the Mayans did. You watch, you learn, and you document. The Mayans had something called the Venus Tables, essentially, an ancient ephemeris focused solely on Venus. Found in the Dresden Codex, one of the oldest surviving books from the Americas, this tabulation meticulously tracked Venus's apparent movements. Here's the kicker. The Venus cycle, according to the Mayans, was 584 days long, which is eerily close to the modern value of about 583.92 days. This kind of precision is baffling, considering they didn't have modern tools or knowledge of celestial mechanics. The Mayans had several calendars, but the one that aligns with Venus is particularly fascinating. Called the Calendar Round, it was a 52-year period during which their 260-day religious calendar and the 365-day solar calendar would align. Why 52 years? Because it's close to a common multiple of Mars's and Venus's cycles, creating a window for both planets to appear in the sky simultaneously. They linked this to various events, natural phenomena, and ceremonies, making Venus a core part of their societal framework. For the Mayans, Venus wasn't just a bright object in the sky. It had a much deeper mythological meaning. It was associated with the god Kukulkan, or Quetzalcoatl in Aztec tradition, a feathered serpent deity. Venus's appearances and disappearances were thought to symbolize this god's terrestrial and celestial journeys. Its heliacal rising, where it first becomes visible in the dawn sky, was considered an important event, often associated with warfare, disruption and change. The big question is, how did they manage to make such precise observations? Theories range from basic tools like horizon markers and simple alignments to complex wooden structures serving as makeshift observatories. They didn't have trigonometry or calculus. But what they did have was an extraordinary ability to observe patterns over time and pass down that knowledge generationally. The Sumerians. When it comes to pioneering civilizations, the Sumerians stand tall. Nestled in the cradle of civilization, modern-day southern Iraq, the Sumerians are credited with inventing one of the first forms of writing, complex urban planning, and, get this, an understanding of the solar system that seems almost futuristic. Much like the Mayans, the Sumerians were keen observers of the night sky. However, in their clay tablets and seals, a particularly curious recurring image is found, a depiction of the solar system with specific planetary bodies, some of which would not be discovered until millennia later with the advent of the telescope. There's a significant debate about the exact interpretation of these tablets, but it's undeniably fascinating that these ancient people had such advanced astronomical insights. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence is a Sumerian seal sometimes referred to as the Berlin Seal. On this seal, there's an image depicting what seems to be our sun at the center, surrounded by 11 other celestial bodies. 
Now, if you do the math, counting Earth and our Moon, and then adding the five planets visible to the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, you end up with eight. This means there are still three mysterious celestial bodies. Could they have possibly known about Uranus, Neptune or even the dwarf planet Pluto? Skeptics argue that this might be an abstract representation, but the question remains tantalizingly open. In the Sumerian Enuma Elish, or the Epic of Creation, there's a detailed description of a cosmic battle between gods, leading to the creation of Earth and its surrounding heavens. The narrative, which seems to resonate with modern theories of planetary formation, describes heavenly bodies colliding and merging. While it's easy to dismiss this as mere mythology, some wonder if it could be a poetic record of actual celestial events or knowledge. Delving deeper into Sumerian texts, there's a mention of Nibiru. Some believe it's a yet-to-be-discovered planet that has an elongated orbit, coming close to Earth every few millennia. Mainstream scientists generally dismiss this claim. Yet, the consistent mention of Nibiru in ancient texts makes it a subject of persistent intrigue. How did the Sumerians acquire such knowledge? While it's tempting to think of extraterrestrial teachers or lost advanced technologies, it's more likely that the Sumerians, much like the Mayans, were extraordinary pattern recognizers. They observed, recorded, and hypothesized, passing down knowledge over generations. This oral and written tradition, combined with their dedication to sky-gazing, may have led to their surprisingly advanced understanding of the cosmos. Stonehenge, a monument that has puzzled and fascinated humanity for centuries. Situated on England's Salisbury Plain, this prehistoric ring of massive standing stones evokes a sense of awe and wonder. But what if I told you that this iconic structure was not just a testament to ancient engineering, but also to ancient astronomy? Many of us know of the summer solstice celebrations that occur at Stonehenge, where the sun, on the longest day of the year, rises directly above the heel stone and casts a beam of light directly into the center of the monument. But the intricacies go much deeper. Stonehenge aligns not just with the summer solstice, but also the winter solstice and the equinoxes. The placement of these stones isn't haphazard. They've been meticulously arranged to mark key solar and lunar events. Beyond the more noticeable alignments with solstices, many researchers suggest that Stonehenge could function as an advanced lunar calendar. The monument's 56 Aubrey holes, named after the 17th century antiquarian John Aubrey, may have been used to predict lunar eclipses. By moving markers around this circle, ancient astronomers could track the 18.61-year lunar cycle. To think that a civilization without computers or telescopes could devise such a method is truly staggering. Why did the ancient builders of Stonehenge dedicate so much effort to aligning it with celestial events? While the full answer is lost to time, the prevailing theory is that these alignments had spiritual or ceremonial significance. The movement of the sun and moon were deeply intertwined with the beliefs, rituals and agricultural practices of ancient peoples. Stonehenge may have served as a sacred space where these elements converged, acting as a bridge between the earth and the heavens. While we've unlocked many of Stonehenge's astronomical secrets, many questions remain. How did a society without modern tools or machinery transport and erect these massive stones? Were there specific rituals or ceremonies performed during celestial events? Did the people believe in celestial or solar deities? And was Stonehenge a temple dedicated to them? Tucked away in the cliffs of Mali, West Africa, the Dogon people have lived for centuries, preserving an oral tradition that possesses a peculiar element which has baffled scholars and stargazers alike. But what if I told you that this isolated tribe holds knowledge about one of the stars in our sky that they shouldn't, by conventional historical accounts, be aware of? Sirius, also known as the Dog Star, is the brightest star in our night sky and can easily be spotted with the naked eye. What's not visible without the aid of powerful telescopes, however, is Sirius B, a white dwarf star that orbits its brighter companion. Astonishingly, the Dogon have described and revered this invisible star, referring to it as Po Tolo for generations, long before modern astronomers had the technology to discover it in the 19th century. The depth of the Dogon's knowledge is truly staggering. They not only identified Sirius B's existence, but also its elliptical orbit, its immense density, and the fact that it takes 50 years to complete its orbit around Sirius. One has to wonder how did they acquire such detailed and accurate knowledge without any apparent advanced astronomical instruments. 
The primary source of this intriguing connection between the Dogon and Sirius B comes from anthropologists Marcel Griol and Germain Dieterlin in the 1930s and 1940s. However, their findings have stirred debates. Some skeptics suggest that the Dogon might have acquired this knowledge from modern visitors before the anthropologists' arrival. Others posit that Griol and Dieterlin might have influenced the Dogon stories inadvertently. Yet another fascinating theory lies in the realm of ancient alien hypotheses. Some believe that the Dogon could have been visited by extraterrestrial beings who shared this astronomical knowledge. While this theory might seem far-fetched to many, it's an avenue of thought that's exciting to consider. Regardless of the source of their knowledge, the Dogon's reverence for the stars mirrors that of many ancient civilizations. Their oral traditions, dances and rituals are deeply intertwined with the heavens. The Segui ceremony, a once-in-a-lifetime event for the Dogon, occurs every 60 years, approximating the orbit of Sirius B around its companion star, further solidifying the celestial connection. What if I told you that more than a thousand years before the invention of the modern computer, the ancient Greeks had designed a device with an intricate system of gears and mechanisms, all to decode the universe's complex dance? Dive deep with me into the mystery of the Antikythera mechanism, an artifact that challenges our very perception of technological progress. The tale begins in 1901, off the coast of the tiny Greek island of Antikythera. Sponge divers navigating the azure Mediterranean depths stumbled upon a shipwreck. Amidst ancient statues and treasures, they discovered a corroded lump of metal with inscriptions and gears. Initially overlooked, this lump would turn out to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the 20th century. The Antikythera mechanism, once cleaned and examined, revealed an intricate assembly of over 30 meshing bronze gears. Upon closer inspection, scientists and historians realized that this was no ordinary artifact. It was, in essence, an ancient analog computer. The device was designed to predict astronomical events, from the phases of the moon to solar and lunar eclipses, and even the Olympic Games dates. The precision and understanding required to create such a mechanism suggest a level of astronomical and engineering knowledge far beyond what was believed to be present in 150 to 100 BCE, the estimated period of its creation. Over the decades, with the aid of X-ray imaging and advanced computational reconstructions, researchers pieced together the puzzle of the mechanism's functionality. It had dials that indicated the position of the sun, the moon and, astonishingly, possibly the known planets of that time. A rotating black and silver ball showed the moon's phases. Another dial, like a spiral with 223 divisions, matched the Saros cycle an eclipse prediction system that the Babylonians used and the Greeks might have adopted. The layers of complexity in this mechanism are often likened to a Swiss watch, showing the ancient Greeks tremendous foresight and expertise in their astronomical and mechanical pursuits. Have you ever looked up at the stars and wondered how our ancestors interpreted these celestial bodies? What if I told you there was a civilization that not only gazed at the cosmos, but wrote sophisticated texts that connected life, nature, and the universe in one profound framework? This was the Vedic civilization, a culture that emerged around the same time when the pyramids were being built in Egypt, but halfway across the world in the Indian subcontinent. Their fascinating contributions to astronomy, philosophy, and mathematics are still evident in modern society. Yet their beliefs and lore seem to intertwine with other ancient civilizations, even hinting at advanced technologies and extraterrestrial connections. So let's embark on a journey into the past to a time when the Vedas were being composed and uncover the intriguing world of the Vedic civilization. The Vedic civilization is named after the Vedas, which are the oldest scriptures in Hindu literature. But these are not just religious texts. They are in many ways a window into the culture, science and philosophy of a society that thrived between 1500 and 500 BC. A significant component of ancient Indian society, the Vedic civilization spanned across the northern and northwestern parts of India, covering the modern-day states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and parts of Rajasthan. The Vedic civilization's chronology itself is intriguing. Its beginning coincides with the end of the Indus Valley civilization, leading some to suggest that the Vedic people might have been the successors of the Indus Valley people. Others suggest that they were entirely distinct entities. 
with the Vedic civilization being pastoral and nomadic compared to the urban, settled life of the Indus Valley civilization. However, it's clear that both civilizations were remarkably advanced for their time. The civilization gets its name from the four Vedas, Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, and Atharvaveda. These texts are a collection of hymns, rituals, and chants used in religious rites and ceremonies. The texts are written in Sanskrit, and they provide valuable insights into the societal structure, economic practices, and philosophical beliefs of the Vedic people. But they also contain some intriguing elements that have sparked debates among scholars and enthusiasts alike. References to advanced astronomical knowledge, mentions of flying machines or vimanas, and sophisticated metallurgical practices raise questions about how much the Vedic civilization knew and understood. Some argue that these elements point towards ancient technology, possibly even interaction with extraterrestrial intelligence, while others interpret them as metaphors or religious symbolism. The debate continues, making the Vedic civilization an endless source of intrigue and fascination. The Vedic civilization has left an indelible mark on the world, and its influence continues to shape our modern lives in ways that we may not even recognize. We owe a great deal of our understanding of early philosophy, astronomy, mathematics and health sciences to this ancient civilization. Take, for instance, the concept of zero. Today, we take it for granted, but it was during the Vedic period that mathematicians began grappling with this revolutionary concept, changing the course of mathematics forever. Vedic astronomy was equally advanced. The texts detail a deep understanding of celestial mechanics. The Vedas describe how the Earth revolves around the Sun, a fact that was only widely accepted much later in human history. They also mention Vimanas, which many interpret as references to flying machines, causing speculations about possible advanced technology or even ancient aviation. The health sciences also saw significant advancements during the Vedic period. The Rigveda and Atharva Veda mention numerous plants and herbs used for medicinal purposes, marking the early beginnings of Ayurveda, one of the world's oldest holistic healing systems. Yoga, a practice that is now globally recognized for promoting physical and mental well-being, also finds its roots in the Vedic civilization. In terms of societal contributions, the Vedic civilization also pioneered the caste system, an intricate social structure that has shaped Indian society for centuries. While controversial in its implications, it provides unique insights into the cultural and social organization of the time. Of course, the spiritual philosophy of the Vedas has had a profound influence, forming the foundation for Hinduism and inspiring later philosophies like Buddhism and Jainism. The teachings emphasize the pursuit of knowledge, the harmony of the individual and the cosmos, and the principles of Dharma, Righteousness, Arthur, Wealth, Karma, Desire, and Moksha, Liberation, Desire. However, some elements of the Vedas have sparked lively debates. References to advanced technologies and knowledge that seems beyond the scope of a civilization from that era have led some to theorize about extraterrestrial involvement or connections with other ancient civilizations. When we start to dig into the intricacies of the Vedic civilization, we uncover striking resemblances to other ancient cultures, suggesting possible connections or shared influences. One of the most intriguing of these is the connection to ancient Egypt. Both civilizations flourished around the same time and shared surprisingly similar practices. For instance, the concept of Mart in Egyptian civilization closely mirrors the Vedic principle of Artai, both denoting cosmic order and moral law. Furthermore, both civilizations demonstrated advanced knowledge of astronomy. For instance, the Egyptian pyramids and Vedic structures both show a high level of astronomical alignment. Was this merely a coincidence, or was there a shared underlying knowledge that spanned these civilizations? The connection to ancient Sumer is also noteworthy. The Rig Veda, one of the oldest texts of the Vedic civilization, mentions River Saraswati, which is believed to be the present-day Gagahakra River. Interestingly, Sumerian texts also refer to a river similar to the Saraswati, indicating possible interactions between these civilizations. Another fascinating connection is seen in the similarities between the ancient Harappan symbols and the later Brahmi script used in the Vedic civilization. Could it be that knowledge was passed from one to the other? Perhaps one of the most intriguing theories, however, involves extraterrestrial influences. 
Some theories suggest that the knowledge and advancements of the Vedic civilization were influenced by alien civilizations, citing references to vimanas or flying machines in the ancient texts as evidence. While these connections are intriguing, it's important to approach them with a critical eye. The Vedic civilization, much like a supernova, may have had a relatively short lifespan compared to the cosmic scale of human history, but its impact continues to resonate even today. From the creation of Sanskrit, considered one of the oldest languages in the world and the mother of all Indo-European languages, to the foundational texts of Hindu philosophy, the Vedas, the civilization has left behind a cultural and intellectual legacy that is profound and enduring. Beyond language and religion, the Vedic civilization's contributions to science, particularly mathematics and astronomy, were remarkable. They conceptualized the idea of zero and developed a decimal system of counting, revolutionizing mathematical operations. In the realm of astronomy, they charted the movements of celestial bodies with striking accuracy, underlining a sophisticated understanding of the cosmos. These advancements are not only intriguing for their time, but continue to shape modern scientific thought and practices. The Vedic civilization's influence extended to social structures as well. The system of Varnas, a social hierarchy that would later evolve into the caste system, can trace its origins back to the civilization. While this has been a controversial legacy, it underscores the deep-seated influence of the Vedic civilization on the societal fabric of the Indian subcontinent. There are also fascinating yet controversial theories about the Vedic civilization's connection to ancient technology and even extraterrestrial life. References to viminas, or flying machines in ancient texts, have sparked speculation about advanced, possibly alien technology. While these theories often skirt the realm of fringe science, they certainly add to the intrigue surrounding this civilization. As we delve deeper into the lore of the Vedic civilization, we find intriguing parallels and points of convergence with other ancient civilizations. One such connection arises with the Sumerians, one of the earliest civilizations in the world that sprouted in the fertile crescent of Mesopotamia. Like the Vedic civilization, the Sumerians had a pantheon of gods and they too were advanced in astronomical observations. Sumerian texts also speak of flying gods and chariots, which mirror the Vedic tales of Vimanas. Is it a coincidence that two distinct civilizations, separated by geography, came up with similar tales, or does it point towards a shared interaction with advanced technology, possibly extraterrestrial? Adding to the mystery are the theories postulating a connection between ancient civilizations and extraterrestrial beings. Ancient alien theorists propose that gods in both the Vedic and Sumerian pantheon were, in fact, advanced extraterrestrial beings who were mistaken as deities. They cite references to advanced technology, like the Vimanas in Vedic texts, and the detailed astronomical knowledge that far surpassed what would have been possible with the technology of the time. Furthermore, striking similarities in architectural designs, symbolism and religious rituals found across ancient civilizations have led to speculations of a shared ancient culture or a mother civilization. Some theories even suggest that this civilization could be the mythical city of Atlantis, which spread its knowledge across the world before it was lost to time. We've journeyed through millennia, across continents, and even ventured into the cosmos as we've explored the mysteries of the Vedic civilization, We've seen their incredible contributions, pondered their connections to other ancient civilizations, and even dared to question the possibility of ancient alien interactions. Whether or not these theories are true, they give us a deeper appreciation for the breadth of human history and the fascinating tapestry of cultures that have shaped our world. So, the next time you gaze up at the night sky, remember the Vedas, the Sumerians, and wonder, what could the ancients see that we've forgotten? Picture the grandeur of ancient Egypt, mighty pharaohs, the majestic sphinx, and of course, the awe-inspiring pyramids. Now, take a leap through time to the Roman Empire, famous for its innovative engineering and renowned military conquests. But what if I told you that these two mighty civilizations are more intertwined than you'd ever imagined? What if the pyramids, one of the ancient world's greatest wonders, held a fascinating chapter in the narrative of Roman expansion? Yes, that's right. Today we'll dive into the dramatic shift from the Pharaonic era of Egypt to its time under Roman rule and unravel the influence of the Romans on Egypt's most iconic structures. 
To appreciate the magnitude of change that the end of the Pharaoh's era marked, we must first understand the incredible influence and grandeur of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Spanning over 3,000 years, the era of the Pharaohs was marked by a series of ruling dynasties, each leaving its mark on the land of the Nile. From the Old Kingdom era, when the pyramids were constructed, to the Middle and New Kingdoms, when Egypt expanded its influence through military campaigns and trade, the civilization thrived, prospered and demonstrated its resilience in the face of historical turmoil. And at the heart of it all were the pharaohs, the god-kings of Egypt, the intermediaries between the gods and the people. Through an intricate, deeply spiritual system of governance, these rulers commanded the respect and devotion of their subjects, ensuring the continuity of their civilization. However, the arrival of Alexander the Great in 332 BC marked a significant turning point. The Ptolemaic dynasty that he established was Hellenistic in nature, marking the beginning of the end of pharaonic rule. Cleopatra VII, the last pharaoh, was a symbol of this fusion of Greek and Egyptian cultures. Her intelligence, charisma and strategic alliances with Roman leaders Julius Caesar and Mark Antony made her a significant historical figure. Yet her reign was fraught with political challenges and personal tragedies. When she famously took her life in 30 BC, the age of the pharaohs effectively ended. The Egypt that Cleopatra left behind was an empire on the precipice of profound change. This period marked the end of Egypt's independence and the beginning of a new era under the control of a burgeoning empire. Rome. Now, as we move into the Roman conquest of Egypt, we find ourselves navigating a series of strategic moves and political intrigues. With the death of Cleopatra, the land of the Nile was effectively annexed by Rome and turned into a province under the control of Octavian, who would later be known as Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. But why was Egypt so attractive to the Romans? The reasons were primarily economic and strategic. Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. Its fertile lands, nourished by the annual flooding of the Nile, yielded crops that fed the Roman populace and fueled its armies. Plus, it was a gateway to the riches of Africa and the Near East. Roman control of Egypt marked a significant shift in power dynamics, as it was the first time Egypt had been ruled by a foreign power. Yet even as the Romans wielded their influence, they couldn't ignore the deep cultural and religious roots of the Egyptians. They adopted some of the local gods, including Isis and even the tradition of pharaohs to an extent. The Roman emperors, like the pharaohs before them, projected themselves as godlike figures, often adorning themselves in traditional Egyptian garb in statues and reliefs. Still, as they maintained this facade of cultural integration, the Romans also pursued their own interests. One such interest, intriguingly, might have been the mysterious and awe-inspiring structures dotting the Egyptian landscape, the pyramids. So what did it really mean to be Egypt under Roman rule? And while there was certainly cultural assimilation as Romans adopted Egyptian gods and traditions, Egypt also became a Roman province. This meant taxation and Egypt was heavily taxed. The fertile Nile Delta was a treasure trove producing grain, papyrus and precious gems, all of which found their way into Roman coffers. Yet even as the riches of Egypt fueled the Roman Empire, there were also periods of unrest. The Egyptian populace, after centuries of being ruled by god-kings, now found themselves subjects of a distant emperor and Roman bureaucrats, who were more interested in wealth extraction than in the preservation of the ancient Egyptian culture. The impact of the Roman rule on the Egyptian landscape was also significant. Roman architecture began to sprout across Egypt, from the coastal city of Alexandria to the southern city of Aswan. Temples to Roman gods were constructed alongside ancient Egyptian temples, and Roman-styled villas were built alongside traditional Egyptian homes. The juxtaposition of these two distinct architectural styles showcases the collision of two powerful civilizations. In the midst of this cultural and architectural synthesis, the pyramids stood timeless. What the Romans thought of these ancient structures and how they interacted with them is a question that delves deep into the realm of speculation. A curiosity that tickles our imagination, the pyramids. Timeless behemoths of stone, their grandeur a testament to a civilization's past glory. But when the Romans first laid their eyes on them, what did they think? What did they do? We know from various accounts that the Romans, like the Greeks before them, were fascinated by the pyramids, their size, their age, their engineering. Everything about them was a wonder. 
Some Roman writers, such as Pliny the Elder, wrote extensively about them. Pliny, in his natural history, called them an idle and foolish exhibition of royal wealth, but his detailed descriptions betray a fascination with their complexity and longevity. But did the Romans ever venture inside? Were they, as some believe, the last people to raid the pyramids for their treasure? Archaeological evidence suggests that by the time the Romans arrived in Egypt, the pyramids had been standing for over 2,000 years. Many of them were already heavily looted and most of the treasure was long gone. The Great Pyramid itself was sealed and it is highly unlikely the Romans had the technology to break in without leaving evidence of their intrusion. Yet stories of Roman treasure hunters guided by ancient maps and legends seeking the secrets of the pyramids persist. Could there have been rogue Roman officials or adventurous explorers who attempted to find hidden chambers and undiscovered loot? The notion is romantic, albeit historically tenuous. In truth, the Romans probably treated the pyramids with the same curiosity and awe as we do. They were relics of a bygone era, timeless monuments that represented a civilization that was ancient even in their time. Rather than the ransacking conquerors some may envision, the Romans may have been the first tourists gazing upon the wonders of a fallen empire. The line between treasure hunter and archaeologist can be a blurry one. Did Romans ransack the pyramids in search of hidden wealth, or were they preservationists attempting to safeguard and understand these impressive structures? Let's dive deeper. We have records of Roman emperors such as Augustus and Hadrian visiting Egypt and expressing a great interest in its antiquities. In fact, many Roman leaders funded expeditions to explore and document Egypt's monuments. They brought back a wealth of knowledge about Egyptian culture, language and history. So it's clear the Romans held a fascination for Egypt's past, but did this translate into a respect for its physical artifacts? Unfortunately, the answer is not straightforward. While some Roman officials genuinely sought to understand and preserve Egypt's heritage, others saw the ancient monuments as resources to be exploited. For example, there's evidence of stone from the pyramids being quarried for other building projects. The situation gets even murkier when we consider the concept of treasure hunting. The phrase conjures images of rogue explorers plundering tombs and temples for gold and jewels. But in the context of the Roman period, treasure could also refer to knowledge, historical artifacts or even mystical power. Pyramids with their ancient hidden chambers could hold untold secrets in the Roman imagination. In a strange twist of fate, the Roman obsession with Egypt might have inadvertently led to some preservation. Many Egyptian artifacts found their way to Rome, effectively being saved from the ravages of time and later, more destructive conquerors. So the Romans' relationship with the pyramids and Egypt's treasures was complicated, to say the least. A mix of reverence, curiosity, greed and pragmatism that has left us with a wealth of questions and a rich, albeit confounding, historical legacy. The Roman period was a pivotal chapter in the long, complex story of Egypt. How the Romans interacted with the pyramids, the Sphinx and other Egyptian antiquities has significantly shaped our understanding of these iconic structures. For one thing, Romans played a key role in the spread of Egyptomania, the fascination with all things Egyptian. This phenomenon was popular in Rome even before Egypt was annexed as a province. Statues, obelisks and other Egyptian antiquities were transported to Rome to decorate public buildings and private villas, and the Roman aristocracy even had a fad for Egyptian-style garden ornaments. But Rome's influence went beyond simply popularizing Egyptian style. Roman engineers, architects and scholars also studied and documented Egyptian monuments in great detail. The records they left behind have been invaluable for modern Egyptologists, providing insight into the state of these structures in antiquity. Another Roman contribution was the preservation of Egypt's built heritage, albeit indirectly. By incorporating Egypt into their empire, the Romans brought relative stability and prosperity to the region, allowing for the maintenance and repair of ancient monuments. While there were cases of Romans quarrying stone from the pyramids for their own construction projects on the whole, these monuments were largely respected and preserved during the Roman period. However, the Romans also unwittingly contributed to some destruction. The trade in Egyptian antiquities, coupled with the frequent treasure hunts, led to the loss and damage of many artifacts and structures. Overall, the Romans left an indelible mark on Egypt and its ancient heritage, 
their influence is evident in everything from the physical state of the pyramids to our contemporary fascination with this civilization. The story of the Romans and the pyramids is a complex tapestry, woven from threads of curiosity, respect, exploitation and ultimately preservation. It's a testament to the enduring allure of Egypt's past and a reminder of how our understanding of history is shaped not only by the events of antiquity, but by those who have studied it in the centuries since. And as always, thanks for watching.